Welcome back, 80s fans. For this episode, I thought I would do a line of cereals that has a wide variety of different flavors, and it's also been requested by you, the fans. So, let's get started with the Monster Cereals. In 1970, General Mills cereal was making critical decisions on a new breakfast cereal. At the time, they were having some great success by adding in marshmallows to their breakfast cereals. Lucky Charms in 1964, Wackies in 65, and Kaboom in 69. So they once again used a marshmallow theme, which led to two brand new cereals in 1971. The first cereal is Count Chocula, which is a twist on the monster Count Dracula. And it's named that way because of all the chocolate goodness tucked away inside. So good that it'll make you say, yeah, I guess that works too. <laughs> the second cereal is Frankenberry, which is a twist on the monster Frankenstein. And it's named that way because it tastes just like Frankens. Or is it strawberries? I always get this too confused. Seriously? How could you? Deal with it, sister. <laughs> the very first commercial to promote both these cereals showcased both monsters attempting to outshine the other. Frankenberry. But I've got chocolate sweeties. Well, I've got berry flavored sweeties. Cult chocula. Frankenberry. Just wacky. <laughs> Selling monsters. No, you fool. Count chocula is well as that. Ah, piffle. Frankenberry is better than that crap. Crap? Well, at least you can sink your teeth into Count Chocula. Those teeth will rot away faster by eating your awful cereal. Awful? Why, well, I ought to pull those bolts right out of your fat Come neck on, and I was stupid pull those guys. Don't mind. I'm trying to educate the viewers on how you guys got started. Fine. Fine. <sighs> Anyways. By 1972, the monster cereals had proved extremely popular with kids. So much so that the University of Maryland was forced to conduct a study on why food dyes in Frankenberry were causing kids' poop to turn a pinkish color. Ew! 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 Hmm. It's like berries. In 1973, a third contender was brought out to this scary breakfast table and took center stage. Oh! Oh! Was it a skeleton? No, not a skeleton. It's the ghost Booberry. Yes, Booberry! Take a seat, Ooh, you! Real rude! Blueberry would be touted as the very first cereal that tasted like blueberries. Even the marshmallows were blue in color. In the commercials, Blueberry tried his best to crowbar himself into this two-sided fight. Frankenberry's got strawberry-flavored marshmallows. Count Chocula's got chocolate marshmallows. But I've got blueberry-flavored marshmallows. And of course, this caused the other monsters to flee in terror. <laughs> Booberry also went on to have great success. Hey, we were told you guys have a ghost problem here? Uh, no. Oh, our mistake. Greetings. What? You guys have a ghost problem here? No, there are no ghost problems here. Yo, you guys have a ghost problem here? Dum 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 dum! The popularity of these cereals continued, so one year later, General Mills decided to release a fourth monster cereal. That one was a skeleton cereal, right? No, there are no skeleton monster cereals. It's Fruit Brute. Oh, so the thing I see, pal. This fourth cereal named Fruit Brute featured a werewolf and a fruity tasting cereal. In the commercials, Fruit Brute was given a proper introduction. Cereal Fruit Brute, part of your nutritious breakfast. But it was never that popular enough with kids to be officially added into many of the commercials that aired in the following years. Finally, exactly 10 years later in 1984, Fruit Brute just couldn't sustain his popularity and disappeared forever from the cereal aisle. Wait, what? That's what I call a disappearing act. Who cares about him anyway? We all know that kids bought Count Chocula instead. No kids demand more Frankenberry. Not before kids bought a box of Booberry. Again with this Booberry. What kid wants berries when they can have chocolate? What? Guys, can this wait till later? Sorry. Sorry. In the 1980s, the monster characters began taking on a more sinister look, from a cartoon cel-shaded appearance to creepy pencil drawing type animations. Even the marshmallows were renamed Monster Mallows. <laughs> By the time 1987 rolled around, General Mills was feeling the pressure to revive that fruity void that Fruit Brute left behind. 
and a fifth monster cereal was introduced called Yummy Mummy. More fruity flavored than its predecessor, this yummy cereal would be uncovered when the monsters traveled to Egypt. Hey, have a bite. <laughs> it's new fruity yummy mummy cereal. For the next five years, there would be four monster cereals once again. But in 1993, Yummy Mummy's sales caused the Fruity Mummy Yummy to disappear. Whoa! Also in the 1990s, General Mills tried various gimmicks for the remaining cereal monsters, including googly eye packaging, Casper the ghost shapes, even bright colored marshmallows. Once sales began tapering off, General Mills began releasing the cereals only around Halloween time. But in 2013, it was decided that nostalgia was in, and in a surprising move, released all five monster cereals all at the same time. Very cool. All right, guys, so how do I rate these? Well, I've always enjoyed Count Chocolate because, well, it's made with chocolate, but kid doesn't like chocolate. And Frankenberry was always a good substitute if you weren't in a chocolatey mood. Same with Boo Berry, it just had that different appeal because how many cereals are blue in the first place? Now, Fruit Brute, I was too young to remember Fruit Brute being on the cereal aisle, but Quentin Tarantino did a great job at giving this cereal a cult-like status when he put the box in his movies like Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs. But Yummy Mummy, I was very, very surprised to see because I remember when it came out back in the 80s. Even opening a box and tasting them once again, I mean, it tastes just like the 1980s. I'm not sure younger kids will understand what that means, but it really does. So collectively, I have to give all these cereals a big nostalgic overload. All right, guys, and until next time, make sure you buy Frank and Betty. You show stealer, buy Count Chocula. Boo Betty, yummy mummy. Bro. Oh, oh, how about trying my new cereal? Huh? Uh -huh. It's brand new called Skellerons. Here, have a bowl. Skellerons? Yeah, tastes weird. What's this made out of? Made from 100% of my ribcage parts. <laughs> Put up this complete balanced breakfast. <laughs>Kid growing up in the 1980s surely remembers Kool-Aid from the nostalgic flavors to the crazy Kool-Aid Man campaigns that they launched. So today, we're gonna look at the complete history of that wacky wild Kool-Aid. Now, Kool-Aid originally began in 1928 at a time when flavored drinks were just becoming commonplace. And after dabbling in other business ventures like ice cream flavors and malted milks, they found their main success in selling drink mixes and offered up six main flavors. Grape, orange, cherry, lemon lime, raspberry, and lastly strawberry, which kept rotating in and out with root beer over the next couple of decades. General Foods then took out three different newspaper ads and found that kids resonated best with the ad featuring a Kool-Aid pitcher with a face on it. This humanistic quality would ultimately lead to the birth of one of the most iconic characters to grace Saturday morning commercials during the 1970s, Kool-Aid Man. Oh yeah, Kool-Aid here, bringing you fun. Kool-Aid's got thirst on the run, get a big, wide, happy ear to hear Kool-Aid's money. Just by yelling, hey Kool-Aid. Hey Kool-Aid! Oh yeah. Kool-Aid Man would then burst out of a nearby wall to quench the thirst of kids everywhere. Hey, Kool-Aid! Oh yeah, here comes Kool-Aid. There's a recipe for win, and there was no scenario too crazy for how Kool-Aid Man would enter the scene and intervene. Oh yeah, here comes Now, I actually had the pleasure of talking to the very person that played Kool-Aid Man in those commercials throughout the 70s, Tom Anthony, who was also no stranger to commercial stunt work since he was also hired as Ronald McDonald's stunt double in the McDonaldland commercials. When you go in to go to work, you go in early, like six in the morning, and the makeup lady does your makeup. Like when you put all this stuff on, was it like hot on the set? The lights are very high. They come in for a close-up, then they use a little light, but it's not, it's not hot. No. So you put in a pretty much a full work day then. Oh yeah, we used to work eight, 10 hours a day, you yeah. know. And Tom was invaluable since Kool-Aid Man was required to pull off some visually appealing stunts for every commercial that he was involved in. In fact, 
Tom gave me this photo to share in this video where you can see this costume Kool-Aid man in action with the exception of the mouth being left off the outfit. And this was done because it was easier to animate his mouth moving during the post-production process. And as the Kool-Aid ad campaign kept evolving, well, we ended up getting other catchy slogans like, here comes Kool-Aid, here comes Kool-Aid, here comes Kool-Aid, to Kool-Aid to the rescue, Kool-Aid to the rescue, to Kool-Aid is for kids for a big thirst. Kool-Aid Man then eventually found himself exploding out of the TV and into comic books and video games? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Yep, by 1983, Kool-Aid Man comic books were being published by Marvel that gave Kool-Aid Man all new adventures as he battled these new foes called the Thirsties. These little lightning bolt leeches would give kids severe cases of cotton mouth until Kool-Aid Man came to the rescue and saved the day. Oh yeah, we'll show those cotton mouth foes. Then after reading these comics and turning to the back page, well, it revealed that you could also fight all thirsties in a brand new Kool-Aid Man video game? Wow, and save up 125 Kool-Aid points and you can send away for a free copy of either Kool-Aid Man for the Atari or the Intellivision. But what's cool about this game is in the Atari version, well, you bounced around as Kool-Aid Man collecting thirsties to keep the Kool-Aid from being drained on the bottom of the screen. But on the other side of the coin, you had the option to pick up the Intellivision version, which was a whole new, completely different game. And in this version, you get to control kids running around a house to collect Kool-Aid items. Once found, you could then summon Kool-Aid Man to kill off those pesky thirsties. And then if you had any of those proof of purchases left over, you could then buy other Kool-Aid items that were found in the middle of this page, like a Kool-Aid Man watch, Kool-Aid Man canteen, or a Kool-Aid Man baby bottle? What the hell am I gonna do with this? Kool-Aid Man comics would be continued to be released once a year until they reached nine issues to continue the adventures of Kool-Aid Man and the latest gimmicks they were pushing. Now, even though those pesky thirsties never made the transition to TV, one character that did, however, was a short-lived villain in 1987 called Scorch. This sun-like baddie appeared in the comic books, had a toy you could send proof of purchases out for, and also helped launch the Kool-Aid sweepstakes caper, where kids could win Toys R Us shopping sprees, hats, jump ropes, and even, uh, more baby bottles. Uh. When it came to the Kool-Aid flavors side of things, well, the 1980s brought us one new flavor year after year, starting with their all-new Punch Bunch Flavor Family. And kicking off this flavor campaign in 1980 was fan favorite Mountain Berry Punch. New from Kool-Aid, Mountain Berry Punch! That's cool! Pouring on kids' five very favorite flavors. Sunshine Punch followed in 82, the rebranding of Tropical Punch in 83, Rainbow Punch in 84, Strawberry Falls Punch in 86. It's thrilling, it's wild, the Strawberry Falls Punch. It's the taste you're gonna fall for. And bringing up the rear in 87 is Surf and Berry Punch. Here it comes, new Surf and Berry Punch Kool-Aid. Cool. Talk about a lot of punch, six in all, with a few flavors released in between, like Apple in 81, and Berry Blue, released in 88. Now one thing that was so memorable about Kool-Aid back in the 1980s were those crazy commercials. Wacky wild Kool-Aid style. Kool-Aid cooler. Kool-Aid style. The entire wacky wild Kool-Aid style era is the very definition of what the 1980s was all about. And it gave us commercials that took video editing to the max by creating the most insane visuals possible at the time. Now these were obviously inspired by all those MTV music style videos airing back then. And I don't know if these production guys were on drugs or what, but man, I love these. 1988 proved to be a huge turning point for the company as most of the packaging changed from glasses of Kool-Aid to Kool-Aid Man having all kinds of athletic adventures. Yep, and it was Kool-Aid Man doing what Kool-Aid Man did best, having fun. Oh no! Oh yeah! And the commercials also introduced the Wacky Warehouse ad campaign, where anything could happen. And this was a place where they showed off that they were always developing new flavors and new ideas like Kool-Aid coolers and Kool-Aid freezer pops. 
Now, Kool-Aid had already created a whole fantasy land of characters so far, but the best was about to come because one of my favorite eras of Kool-Aid was when they started rolling out the coolest prehistoric drinks ever created. In 1990, things were kicked off with a pink shark invading our summer with the pink colored Sharkleberry Finn. It's a new pink flavor from Kool-Aid. New Sharkleberry Finn. Fantastic. It tastes so here. Next in this lineup was Purple Saurus Rex, featuring that crazy purple dinosaur stomping through the city. Rocky, it's wild! It's new, new Purple Saurus Rex from Kool-Aid. It's prehistorically. <gasps> And then in 1991, that crazy Elvis singing crocodile sang his way into our hearts with Rockadile Red. Rockadile Red. Man, it tastes so good. Ooh, red and fruit, it just like it should. Rock, rock, rock. Rockadile Red. Oh, the Kool-Aid. It's Rockadilicious. Next up was Pink Swamingo, that crazy pink flamingo that flapped his way into supermarkets. It's the gnarly new flavor from Kool-Aid Burst Soft Drink. Pink Swamingo. Ah. Man, you're really gonna go for Pink Swamingo. Then the Great Blue Dini arrived in 92, that magician octopus, which could change the color of this powder from green to blue when placed in water. Behold my many feats of magic as I change my new Kool-Aid flavor from green to blue. Ooh. You can too. Incredible. Magical taste. Great Blue Dini Kool-Aid. Kablooey. Next up came Incrediberry, the new berry flavor that came from the future, which also changed in color when you added water. And then out of nowhere during the 4th of July came the last gimmicky Kool-Aid of Cherry Cracker, which would crackle and pop like 4th of July fireworks upon being dumped in water. It's Cherry Cracker, the exclusive new flavor from Kool-Aid. You can pour the packet into a dry pitcher, add water, and mix up the atomic flavor mics to pack a powerful punch. And this is the only time Kool-Aid made this four packet item with the artwork spreading across the entire package. Now, after giving us so many memorable Kool-Aid flavors in the early 90s, well, the next era of Kool-Aid was not really as memorable. Because even though they threw together every fruit combination imaginable, well, they did so without any gimmicky characters, which left this period of time pretty forgettable. But they did manage to squeeze in this cool Halloween-themed Kool-Aid flavor, which involved blackberries. Now, even though the magic of these 1980s and 90s flavors are long gone, they do, however, seem to rotate some of these flavors back in every once in a while, like Sharkleberry Finn here. The only downside is, well, they don't put it in the original packaging, which, yeah, major downside. And some of the other iconic flavors from the 1980s that are super, super hard to find, like Mountain Berry Punch here, Strawberry Falls, and Berry Blue, well, good luck finding them because they're super hard to find and they haven't re-released them since the 80s. But as for these iconic packages of the past, well, I can't tell you how hard it was to track all these down, so I have to give a big thanks to Jimmy Tucker in helping me find some of these amazing packets that have never been opened in over 30 years. So for me, to be able to show you all these packages, how they once looked in the 1980s, is pure nostalgic overload. Oh yeah! <sighs> that got a cool it, man. Here, have a baby bottle. <laughs> Today on I Write the 80s, we're looking at those little cards that caused all kinds of commotion in the 1980s. And those were called Garbage Pail Kids. In the early 1980s, Cabbage Patch dolls were all the rage, even to the point where people were paying high dollar just to have one in time for Christmas. But over at the Topps Trading Card Company, something special was about to happen. Topps had a card series called Wacky Packages, and in it, they spoofed various products. And it was for this series that artist John Pound took the Cabbage Patch Kids product and spoofed it by calling it Garbage Pail Kids. Around the same time, Topps was looking to create a new trading card line, and they ended up taking John's idea, and the Garbage Pail Kids were born. The series consisted of putting Cabbage Patch dolls in twisted situations and scenarios, and there were a total of 41 unique cards to collect, with each one having two different names. This was done most likely to spoof the concept of how each Cabbage Patch doll was packaged with a unique name on their birth certificate. 
In the summer of 1985, the cards became an instant hit with kids, and equally hated by mothers everywhere. Now that summer I remember going down to the local drive-thru and just buying tons of these cards and later trading the doubles off to my friends, because that was pretty much the thing to do. They were just very, very popular. Now each pack of Garbage Pail Kids consisted of five cards and a stick of gum. Of course, my favorite cards in this set has to be TV Stevie, Itchy Mickey, Potty Scotty, Uzi Susie, Ash Can Andy, and of course the fan favorite, Adam Bomb. The artist of the series, John Pound, had done an amazing job with the painted artwork, and he made such an impact at Tops that they hired him back to do a second set. And a few months later, the race to collect a second set was on. This all new set brought us cards like Soft Boiled Sam, One Eyed Jack, Bye Bye Bobby, and many more. By the end of 1985, the popularity of these small cards had grown considerably, and in 1986, Topps went on to produce a third series, a fourth series, a fifth series, and even a sixth series. They also branched out and made giant sized cards, candy, folders, keychains, pins, and much more. But sadly, 1987 would be the year that broke the camel's back. The cards had drawn a lot of attention by then, even from the makers of the Cabbage Patch dolls themselves, Coleco. A lawsuit was then filed against Topps, and after Series 10, the Garbage Pails no longer resembled their Cabbage Patch counterparts. Holly Days, Wet Wit, Artie Party, Barbed Wire, yep, they just didn't look like Garbage Pail Kids anymore. But the bad news didn't stop there, because oddly enough, a Garbage Pail Kids movie was quickly produced and went on to be dubbed the worst movie ever made. The network CBS also had a Garbage Pail Kids cartoon ready to air, but quickly pulled it from their Saturday morning cartoon lineup. After the events of 1987, the card series had pretty much ran its course, and the cards no longer had the appeal that the older ones had. So Topps ended the series with set number 15, even though a 16th series was already drawn up and planned. Now fast forward 15 years later, and slowly nostalgia for the cards was returning. And almost 20 years later from when the first set was released, Topps unveiled a brand new set in 2003, called the All New Garbage Pail Kids. And just this year, Topps released a flashback series in 2010 to commemorate the 25th anniversary. Now I gotta say that this set is awesome, and I love how they brought back all the old cards that we all know and love in order to reprint them in the highest quality possible. Not only are the cards printed on glossy cardstock, but they've also included unreleased cards, as well as hilarious Where Are They Now cards, which TV Stevie has to be my favorite out of all of these. Being tossed out with other 80s toys like Simon and My Pet Monster is just classic. I even found the special motion series set to be pretty darn cool. So Tops, here's a special salute from me to you. <clears throat> hey, keep your freaking trash out of here. Welcome back, 80s fans. Now, back in the 1980s, one gimmicky thing cereal companies did was make cereals of our Saturday morning cartoons. Strawberry Shortcake, Mario Brothers, and even the Ninja Turtles. And back then, going to the grocery store to pick this stuff up was awesome. Now, recently I came across an unopened box of Ninja Turtle cereal. I won't say how I came across this item, but let's just say a friend gave it to me. Hey, Chris. Hey. Guess what? It finally came in the mail. My Ninja Turtle cereal I won on eBay. Isn't that awesome? Oh, sweet. I always wanted one of these. Oh. Hey, is that your phone? Right? Yes, it is. Oh, I gotta get going, man. Can I get the cereal back? Yeah. Hey, I'll talk to you later. All right, later. All right, well, enough of that. Let's just open this box. All right. Oh, it smells pretty good, too. All right, well, I haven't poured a bowl of these in like 20 years, so this is kind of cool for me. The cereal resembles something like Chex with marshmallows, and the marshmallows have kind of turned brown due to their age. 
Anyway, let's just check out this box. On the front we have the cartoon turtles showing up to help us eat our cereal. And Donatello brings the spoon, Leo brings the milk, Raph brings the tunes, and Mikey brings the, uh, net? Just what the hell am I going to do with that? Oh boy. Well, moving to the side of the box, we find all the tasty ingredients. Rice, marshmallows, brown sugar, sodium hexa meta whatever, and made by Purina. As in dog food? Oh boy, hope it's not the reason why these turn brown. Of course, looking at the back of the box, we find trading cards for the Ninja Turtles movie. But over time, they would include other things like puzzles, contests, and even holograms. Cowabunga! Alright, so how do I rate this one? Now, I don't remember the cereal tasting all that great back then, but nostalgia alone makes this one pretty awesome. Alright guys, well, that's it for now, so see you next time. Welcome back, 80s fans. This time we're checking out those little cars that set fire to the miniatures world. And those were called Micro Machines. Around 1986, Gloob started releasing these little cars called Micro Machines. Smaller than Hot Wheels, there were tons to choose from. Cars, planes, helicopters, trucks, boats, and more. Of course, who could forget those crazy Micro Machines commercials featuring that fast talker? Micro Machines are the next big thing in collecting cars. Tons to choose from in a variety of colors. Exchange them with your friends. Drive them on the floor. Eat them for breakfast. You'll find dozens of uses for these crazy little things. Shove them up your butt. They'll even come out your nose. Yes, they'll even come out your nose. Collect them all now, because there are over a billion to choose from. And we literally mean a billion to choose from, because we lost the key to the assembly line. Yep, that's right. We can't turn the damn thing off. So act now. Micro Machines, like a lube. Yes, these things were all the rage. But then came the Micro Machines Travel City. Oh yeah! And this was the mecca of Micro Machine Collecting. Now, each piece of the city would come in these little rectangle boxes folded up. Open it up, however, and you'd find all the pieces inside, along with an exclusive car. And each section would form things like a car wash, a hospital, and even a fish and chips. Welcome to fish and chips. How may I help you? And after connecting all the pieces together, the awesome power of Micro Machine City would be released. My god, it's magnificent. Wash your car at Mr. Foam, dump your trash at the city dump, chill out in your awesome ride at the motel. Yeah, you can do it all. Now the city shown here is set up the exact same way that it's found on the back of the box, but I always had a problem with this picture, mainly because the person who put this together didn't know what the hell they were doing. I mean, for instance, they put the bridge back to back with the repair shop, which if you traveled down the bridge, you'd come out the repair shop's door. Stupid. And how the hell am I supposed to get to the city dump? Drive through the water? Lame. But just under a year later, Gloob was back at it again, and they added six more pieces to this travel city. Now you could plant crops at the farm, bounce checks at the bank, and even sport off that bitch and ride at the cycle shop. Of course, you could also take it to the insane levels like I did and make custom pieces, like a marina for boats and a post office. Yeah, I know, I'm a goober. But for quite a few years there, Micro Machines were very popular, spawning video games, outselling Hot Wheels, and at one point, even offering a mail-away exclusive of five golden cars. Unfortunately, I don't seem to have these anymore. Lame. By the mid-90s, the craze of Micro Machines had come to an end but not after spawning off tons of merchandise from various movies and TV shows. Alright guys, so how do I rate this one? Back in the day, Micro Machines were pretty darn cool, and I still think they're pretty cool now, especially when you put the entire city together. The only problem was back then, is that each one of these pieces cost about six to eight dollars a piece, and when you have parents on a budget, I wasn't able to get more than two or three of these when I was a kid. But now that I got everything put together, it's just another nostalgic overload. I don't know if these things will ever be popular again in the future, but until then, and I'll be playing with these.
Today on I Rate the 80s, we're looking at those toys that forever revolutionized the toy industry. And it just happened to be the very first thing I collected as a kid, which were He-Man. Back in 1980, Mattel was in search of a toy line that would equal the success of the hot-selling Star Wars action figures. And after two years of working on a prototype, they ended up releasing a barbarian line of figures called He-Man. Now the first set contained eight figures, which would introduce kids to the battle between good and evil. And in this first set was He-Man, Skeletor, Man-at-Arms, Stratos, Merman, Tila, Zodak, and Beastman. Now, no one knew it at the time, but Mattel was cooking up something that had never been tried before. And their plan was to make a cartoon centered around a toy line and use the cartoon as a marketing platform. Now, this idea is pretty much commonplace now, but back then, this was unheard of. One year later, the He-Man cartoon debuted on television, and a second set of figures were released that rounded out the show's main cast. These included Evil Lynn, Manny Faces, Trapjaw, Ram Man, Triclops, Mechanek, and the blue He-Man clone, Faker. Or, uh, well, he was here just a minute ago. <laughs> that idiotic show host! It is I that took your figure! <laughs> Soon after, Mattel's gamble had paid off, and He-Man became a huge success. The figures were selling like hotcakes, and quickly they released a third set of figures. And this set included classics like Orko, Webster, Clawful, Buzz Off, and more. And even Cobra Khan. Oh, damn it. He-Man was selling so good that Mattel even went on to release vehicles, accessories, and huge playsets as well. Ta-da! Oh. Ah. <laughs> but the following year of 1985 was probably the biggest year for He-Man, as the show had spawned a He-Man movie that introduced us to his sister, She-Ra, as well as a whole new group of bad guys. Now, I remember seeing this movie at the theaters when I was a kid, and it was awesome. But what was even more awesome was that the characters from the movie were now included in Series 4. There was Hordak, Grizzler, Mantena, they're all here, including some more bad guys from He-Man's second season. Ooh, fuzzy. But sadly, the movie's main goal was to introduce us to the world of She-Ra, since that would be replacing the He-Man cartoon later that year. And with He-Man out of the way, Series 5 became dominated by She-Ra's bad guys. Now there was also a She-Ra action figure line released that year too, but those were mainly targeted towards girls. By now, the He-Man toy line was on its last leg, and Series 6 would be the last set produced. But not before giving collectors the now hard to find sorceress figure. Hey baby, come here often. Mm. Now in 2002, Mattel decided to revisit He-Man by releasing a whole new batch of updated figures. And some of these look pretty damn impressive. There was He-Man, Skeletor, Man-at-Arms, Merman, Tila, Trapjaw, and even Cobra Khan. Oh, damn it. Alright guys, so how do I rate these? Well, He-Man was a big part of my childhood, and far back as I can remember. And some of these figures just bring back a lot of good memories. And even the new ones are pretty cool as well. So, this one's another nostalgic overload. All right, 80s fans, well, that's it for me. I'm out of here. Uh-uh! These are exactly what I've been looking for! I'd hand those figures, Skeletor. Those are mine! Eh, not anymore, you irate chump! <laughs> oh, that's it. You asked for it! By the power of Grayskull! Silly Skeletor, he made it for kids. Hey, that's my line! Welcome back, 80s fans. Now since it's the Halloween season, I thought I'd take a look at those short-lived toys that brought on a whole new meaning to sports balls. And those were 
Mad Balls. In early 1985, the Garbage Pail Kids trading cards had just broken onto the scene. They quickly became popular with kids, and it was mainly because of their gross and crazy appeal. But soon after, toy company Amtoy came up with the idea of taking baseball-sized balls and making each one look hideous and creepy. Now all they needed was a name, and Mad Balls were born. The first set of these eight Mad Balls were released in late 85, and these included Screaming Mimi, Oculus Orbis, Hornhead, Dustbrain, Slobulus, Arg, Skullface, and Crackhead, whose name was later changed to Bashbrain, as to not confuse kids with actual crackheads. Now instead of making these things as hard as actual baseballs, Amtoy played it smart and made these things out of a soft foam rubber similar to the Nerf toys, which made these things pretty flexible and fun to play with. Of course, the fan favorite in this entire series had to be, well, Oculus Orbis here. And I also remember Hornhead being used for a lot of promotional flyers. You know it! Hey, how come he gets to be on the flyers and I don't? Well, I am after all a much prettier face. <laughs> oh, don't make me gag. I'm a better looking mad ball than you'll ever be. Oh, please, why don't you just kiss my big fat hairy ass? All right, guys, calm down. You're both gruesome enough to be in promotional flyers. Oh, yeah? You think so? Ah, definitely. As long as you don't look like crackhead here, I think you'll be all right. Guy's scary enough to scare small children. What? <laughs> oh. <laughs> in 1986, Mad Balls had quickly become popular with kids. So much so, that they released a second set of these crazy looking balls shortly thereafter. And this set included Wolf Breath, Snake Bait, Bruise Brother, Swine Sucker, Fist Face, Splitting Headache, Freaky Fullback, and Lock Lips. Which also just happens to be one of the Mad Balls I used to have as a kid. I love you, Mad Ball! Ah, those were the days. Yes, the second set was here, and some of these looked even more gruesome than before. But there are a few balls in this set that showed that Amtoy might have been running low on ideas at this point. Low on ideas? How the hell so? Yeah! Well, come on guys, just look at some of these. Fistface basically looks like Oculus Orbis here in a glove. Freaky Fullbag just looks like a football player's head. And Snakebait? Well, he just looks like a clown-faced Medusa head. What? <laughs> Although the pool of characters chosen showed signs of weakening, Amtoy was determined to milk this cash cow for all it was worth. And Mad Balls then started appearing as stickers, punching bags, gumball machines, pencil erasers, action figures, and even Marvel Comics released a comic book line. In early 1987, a Saturday morning cartoon featuring the Mad Balls was put in production. But sadly, after one episode, the show was cancelled. Now I can't recall if this episode actually aired on TV or not, but damn, being cancelled after only one episode? <laughs> Must have been one horrific show. Ow! <laughs> <sighs> By this time, Mad Balls were starting to lose a lot of steam with kids, and Amtoy made one last attempt to squeak out three more Mad Balls products. A football, a soccer ball, and a basketball. But none of these had the appeal that the original Mad Balls did, and Amtoy ended up closing up shop. For many years, Mad Balls ended up falling into the abyss of obscurity. All up until 2006, that is, when toy company Art Asylum decided to re-release these toys with an updated look. Most of the old Mad Balls ended up getting a facelift treatment for a whole new generation of kids but the appeal of these things were nowhere near their previous counterparts, and the line was quickly cancelled. Alright, 80s fans, so how do I rate these? Well, Mad Balls will probably always be in that oh, I remember those category, because even though they had a bit of success back in the day, they just weren't widely as popular as, say, something like Ninja Turtles. So for this one, I'm just going to have to go ahead and say that these are Nostalgic Mediocre. Nostalgic Mediocre? What the hell is up with that? Oh, that's it. Let's get them, guys. Get him, freaky fullback. Yeah, 
Right! <laughs> what the hell? Oh crap. Today we're turning back the clock to check out those little pink toys called Muscles. But where on earth did these little pink things come from? Well, to answer that question, we must first travel to Japan. In 1979, a weekly comic magazine called Shonen Jump began running a comic series featuring a goofball wrestler named Kenny Kuman. At first, the comic was filled with silly one-shot stories and goofy jokes, but later on, all that fell by the wayside as a stronger and much more compelling storyline overtook the series. And this comic features some of the most craziest looking wrestlers too. There's a Rubik's Cube guy, a toilet paper mummy, and even a urinal with legs. That's right! Kenny Kuman forever! What the? In 1983, the comic became so popular that it spawned not only a cartoon show, but also a line of smaller racer-like figures. And these featured all the different wrestlers from the comics. The first set of these figures included characters like Kenny Kuman, his sidekick, his father, and a few friends and enemies he'd met along the way. And if you're wondering about that urinal with legs, he eventually made it into the second set. Uh, uh, uh. Ooh. Ah, crap. After a few sets of figures had been released, the popularity of these toys caught the attention of toy maker Mattel over in the US. And in the fall of 1985, Kenny Kuman began showing up in US retail stores. Mom, Mom, I want these, I want these! Now the weird thing about this is that Mattel brought over the figures without even bringing over the cartoon or the comics as well. And of course, what better way to introduce us to something than to just make shit up as you go along. But instead of calling these Kenny Kuman, they were called Muscle. And the main character would be called Muscle Man, and one of the main bad guys from the comic named Buffalo Man would now be his arch nemesis called Terry Bull, which was a stupid move since one of Kenny Kuman's friends is actually named Terry Man. Wow, talk about major faux pas. Yep, that's right. Geronimo! Oh, shit. Even the figures themselves were different from their Japanese counterparts, since they were made bigger and from a harder plastic. Now, when I first saw these as a kid, I thought they were cool just based on figures being packaged inside of a trash can. I mean, how cool is that to a kid? I wonder if there's actually a trash can man. Ah, there he is. Hey, I'm here too. Will you just leave me alone? Oh, oh boy. <laughs> In the months that followed, Mattel began releasing other muscle items, like colored muscles and a mail-away poster that finally revealed that there were 233 muscle men to collect? Holy hell! Of course, there is one figure who was left off the poster for some unknown reason. And if you just happen to have him, then consider yourself lucky, because he's highly collectible. Woo! Back off, Kenny Kuman! Now over in Japan, they ended up releasing a whopping 417 figures in all. And most of the later released figures never made it over to the US. And that's a shame, because some of these guys look pretty darn cool. There was a light bulb guy, a prism guy, a ghost, a cassette player, and, uh, what the hell is that? By the time 1987 rolled around, the craze for Kenny Kuman was coming to an end. The story in the comic was finished, production on the cartoon was finished, and the toy line also ceased production. And of course, this also led to Mattel calling it quits as well. Now fast forward to 2008, and Bandai decided to re-release every single Kenny Kuman figure in one giant set. Now this thing is a thing of beauty. All 417 figures in one place, and also a checklist? What more could a muscle fan ask for? Oh yeah, how about the damn cartoon dubbed in English? Now yes, there was a cartoon called Ultimate Muscle that aired in the US in 2002, but this was actually a sequel to the original Kenny Kuman cartoon. But that's a story for another episode. Alright guys, so, how do I rate these? Now I personally loved these little muscle men as a kid, but I 
just wish we would have got that cartoon when I was little. Oh well, I guess I'll just give this one a big bet nostalgic mediocre. What? Well that's it! Oh no you don't! Well, the Super Bowl season is upon us, so I thought I'd turn back the page and review a string of commercials in the 1980s that aired only during the Super Bowl, and those were called the Bud Bowl. In 1989, beer company Budweiser tried out a new marketing campaign of Super Bowl commercials that would feature beer bottles playing football. This Budweiser football game, dubbed the Bud Bowl, was a stop-motion skit of Budweiser facing off against contender Bud Light. Now the actual Bud Bowl contained seven different segments that made up the entire game, and those aired during the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, and even halftime. Hey! And each new commercial shown would continue the game of Bud teams trying to score touchdowns. After the Super Bowl had aired, this simple little concept ended up stealing the show. So much so that the following year, Budweiser came back with Bud Bowl 2. And the hijinks kept on coming, that would ultimately lead up to a crazy snowstorm that overtook the game by the end. By this time, Budweiser was on fire with this idea. Bud Bowl 3 not only brought newcomer Bud Dry into the game, but also actual announcers that hosted the event. And of course, who could forget those crazy cutscenes? Players chasing each other with bottle openers, hiding footballs underneath their labels, and even the band marching onto the field before the game actually ended. Classic. Now Bud Bowl 4 is where things really took a turn for the weird. At this point, everybody was anticipating the next Bud Bowl, but instead of giving us an actual game, they gave us some damn idiot running around looking for his ticket? What the hell's this crap? Yep, that's right, 20 years later and I'm still pissed. And that also meant five continuing commercials of pure garbage. Yeah, I hope you fall and die, you jackass. Well, Budweiser's complaint department must have heard the fans' voices loud and clear, because exactly one year later, Bud Bowl 5 was back to business better than ever. CGI graphics, celebrity announcers, and even Joe Namath? All right. Of course, who could also forget the Bud Rocket, Neon Bud, and even the Illuminator? In 1994, Bud Bowl 6 would mark the last of the Bud Bowls. But not before adding in Marv Albert, Mike Ditka, and even Bum Phillips? Well, are you just gonna stand there or are you gonna pick it up? Another classic. And even underdog Bud Light managed to win their second Bud Bowl due to some weird outside interference. Yep, just plain weird. Hey! Well, in the years that followed, Budweiser retired the Bud Bowl idea and focused on a new marketing campaign, which would include the soon-to-be-popular Budweiser Frogs. Budweiser. Alright, sports fans, so how do I rate these? Well, I personally enjoyed watching these as a kid, and I anticipated them every year. I'm not sure if it has the same appeal for today's audiences, but these, for one, bring back a lot of good memories for me. So, I'm gonna have to give this one another nostalgic overload. Well, it's been about 20 years now since they've done the last Bud Bowl, and I hope they decide to revisit the concept in the future. But until then, just give me a light. I meant a Bud Light. Oh boy. Oh, forget it. Welcome back, 80s fans, to another episode of I Rate the 80s. And this time, we're checking out those little plastic things that were just stickingly awesome called color forms. But where did these little things come from? Well, back in 1951, a man named Harry Kislevitz took an art class and noticed his pencil pouch was always sticking together. Thinking this material could be used as a toy, he began cutting out small shapes, and color forms were born. 
and you can stick these things on just about any shiny surface. Windows, refrigerators, glass, bathtubs, toilets, uh... Blech! Now the first generation of this new toy came packaged in a black box filled with colorful shapes. But fast forward six years later, and color forms started featuring TV characters like Popeye to push the color form's name. Although these looked very crude in design, you could still build piece by piece a scene from the cartoon. Now we enter into the 1980s, and this is a decade where color forms could really thrive. He-Man, Smurfs, G.I. Joe, Shirt Tails, you name it, it was a color form. There was even a 3D Thundercats color form. Wow, and they look so real. What the? Snarf, snarf! Snarf, snarf! Yep, these things just dominated toy aisles. Oh, Mom, Smurf color forms! Whoa! Uh, oh, Cuber! Whoa! Uh, wh Welcome back, Cotter. What the hell is this shit? Now, back when I was a kid, I used to have the Pac Man color form. And I was a big fan of the uh, Pac Man cartoon when I was a kid, so. Of course I had to have this. But uh, inside, yeah, we have the sheets of the color form pieces, and then behind that we have the backer board where you place them. The backboard itself is pretty darn cool, since it features Pac-Land. You could stick Pac-Man in the scene, Miss Pac-Man, Baby Pac, the car running over Baby Pac, and so much more. Or you could just build the scene with the ghost monsters, and then place Pac-Man in the scene to scare him. <laughs> Pac power! Ah, so hard to find good help these days. Man, I used to have hours of fun playing with these little things. Even if the company was too cheap to add the simple color of orange to this yellow ghost. I mean, seriously, a yellow ghost? What the f***? Throughout the 1980s, color forms had become a licensing juggernaut. Alf, Pee Wee, even a Michael Jackson color form? What's with all the little boys in this set? Unfortunately, after the 1980s had ended, so did the huge popularity of color forms. Alright guys, so how do I rate these? Even though I used to have a lot of fun with these things when I was a kid, they had some great ideas and, well, some weird ones as well. But to me, they'll always be another nostalgic overload. Who knows if these will ever become popular again in the future. But, until they do, I'll just be playing with the Irate Gamer color form. Alright, today we're going to review... Oh! Oh! What are we doing? What are we doing? Yeah, what are we doing? Hidey ho there, neighbor! Resistance is futile. Welcome back, 80s fans. This time, we're checking out the one thing that kicked off one of the most popular brands in the 1980s. And that was... The Ninja Turtles. In November of 1983, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird sat at home doodling pictures until it ultimately led to a sketch of mutant turtles holding weapons. After dubbing them the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they knew they were onto something great, and started publishing a black and white comic book with a limited run of only 3,000 copies. The first run sold out within a few weeks, so they printed up another 6,000, and those sold out too. Now it was on to the second issue and they ended up getting over 15,000 orders. And with issue three, 50,000 orders. Double, double. Hey! Yep, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were officially a hit. Hey, where's all the turtle comics? Actually sold out this morning. Got the new issue of Jughead, though. Jughead? Oh, that's stupid. Now these Ninja Turtle comics were done completely in black and white, and featured our ninja fighting heroes taking on the forces of evil. A few issues later, however, the main story started to get a little weird as they traveled into outer space. Whoa! What the heck? Ricky! But despite these setbacks, this turtle soup was just about to come to a boil with younger audiences as a Ninja Turtles toy line was released, oh! then a cartoon show, oh! then a video game. Uh, I just wet myself. In all these new incarnations, the color of their bandanas were altered from being red to each one having their own distinct color so that kids could tell them apart. Of course, the game confused kids everywhere since they used a Turtles comic book cover for the game's label instead of some cartoon image. 
Why are all their bandanas red? What is the reason behind this? And why is this water level so damn hard? Ah! I hate this game! In 1988, another Turtles comic was published, and they called it... Ninja Turtles Adventures. But this time, based off the cartoon. And I used to absolutely love reading this comic. And starting with issue number five, they broke away from the cartoon and crafted their own continuity. And they would be fighting the Shredder, meeting new friends, being kidnapped off world to fight in an intergalactic war, and spent a lot of issues getting back home, which all led up to this fantastic conclusion. Reading this story month to month as a kid and not knowing where the story would go was an awesome feeling. And who can forget their iconic issue number 11, which they would use for all their promotional ads. Awesome. Another cool part of this series was that they used action figure characters that were never going to be used in the cartoon as major players in this comic book storyline. Man Ray, Wingnut and Screwloose, Mondo Gecko. Yep, being a Ninja Turtles fan in 1989 was awesome. Being a Ninja Turtles fan in the 1990s, however, was something else entirely. After issue 25, the Ninja Turtles Adventure series started to decline. Shredder was now nowhere to be found, the stories were shorter, and Raphael was having some weird romance with a fox creature. Just imagine those two getting it on. You. Alright, one more page. For many years to come, Ninja Turtle comics were never the same again. But in 2011, comic publisher IDW finally hit the high note by finally providing a comic book series that Turtle fans could crave. Now I gotta say this series is freaking fantastic, and besides being a retelling of the Ninja Turtles story, they sprinkle each issue with things from the old comics and cartoon show to craft a continuity to the Ninja Turtles world that is just awesome. They even go as far as to explain why they all wear red bandanas before switching over to the colored ones. And I won't ruin it for you because it's pretty damn ingenious. Alright guys, so how do I rate these? Now I never really got into the black and white comic because it just got too weird for my taste after issue number 4. So I'm just going to have to give that one a nostalgic mediocre. But as for the Archie Comics version, well, I have to give that one a nostalgic overload. Hey, what about my comic? Oh please, don't bother me with that garbage. Garbage? Get a moose! Okay! I don't always get myself into these things. Happy St. Patrick's Day, laddies! And to usher in this festive holiday, we're taking a slight detour to the 1970s in order to look at the shamrock shakes offered by McDonald's and the mascot who promoted them called Uncle O'Grimacy. In 1970, McDonald's ushered in St. Patrick's Day with a new minty milkshake called the Shamrock Shake. Adding in this item for a limited time only would be a tradition that happened on a yearly basis. Even in the McDonald's TV commercials, the milkshake stealing grimace promoted the minty shakes by stealing every single one of them. One year, he even turned green from his shenanigans. My feet green, my hands green, I'm turning green all over. Oh well. What a crazy guy. Ooh, hey Grimace, we're just talking about- <laughs> Ow. Ooh, Shamrock. In 1974, McDonald Land would receive an unexpected visit from Grimace's Irish uncle, Uncle O'Grimacy. Uh, oh, sure and be car a house, me little nephew. Here, Uncle O'Grimacy. Oh, you shouldn't have a Shamrock shake, I take it. Oh, it's great. It's green! Shaped like Grimace, green like a Shamrock, this Irish uncle would solicit shamrock shakes like there was no tomorrow. But McDonald's shamrock shakes, since they're at McDonald's only for a short time, I got one for everyone! And if you're asking yourself where have you heard that voice before, well, you probably remember it from this Saturday morning cartoon character. You know what we build here? You! Not out of wood or metal, but out of food! And those voice actors back then are pretty darn memorable. Hey, boys and girls! Are you hankering for a hunka? Chunka of a munka? Some things are just left best in the past.
But Uncle O'Grimacy didn't stop with just the commercials, because McDonald's began making Uncle O'Grimacy plastic puppets, white cups, green rings, blue diamonds, and purple horseshoes! Do you mind? Sorry. By the time the 1980s rolled around, Uncle O'Grimacy was ultimately phased out, along with the other countless McDonald Land characters. But that's a story for another episode. Alright guys, so, how do I rate this? Now, I vaguely remember this Uncle O'Grimacy character from my childhood, but I also feel that anything from this McDonaldland era of time is very, very nostalgic to me. So, Uncle O'Grimacy, you get my seal of nostalgic overload approval. So, until next time, shamrock it up, baby. Welcome back, 80s fans. Today we're covering possibly one of the coolest toys ever offered in a McDonald's Happy Meal. And those were the McDonald's Changeables. During the 1980s, the Happy Meal program at McDonald's was gaining some major steam with kids. Especially by 1986, when they acquired licenses to produce toys featuring the Muppet Babies, Garfield, and Destructoid Bananas. Destructoid Bananas? I don't remember these. Ugh. During 1987, another franchise, Transformers, was hitting their popularity peak. And in an attempt to create a like-minded toy, McDonald's Changeables were born. Half menu item, half robot, these little guys were made to appeal to fans of the Transformers. There was a Big Mac, Quarter Pounder, Chicken McNuggets, Egg McMuffin, Milkshake, and uh... Where's the fries at? McDonald's Goblins, always taking my fries. Give me that. And yes, even a large fry. Of course, there was always the rejected McDonald's ashtray robot, too. To test their popularity with kids, the Changeables were given a trial run in the St. Louis, Missouri locations. These types of test runs were pretty common back in the day to figure out which Happy Meal toys should go nationwide. They did this with SeaWorld, Archie, Potato Head Kids, Banana Buddies, Banana Buddies? What the hell's a banana butt? I should've known. When the test run was over, the toys were a hit. And two years later on May 19th, the Changeables went nationwide with a full animated commercial. Our urgent mission on Earth is to stop the Munchoids stealing the Happy Meal. Let's duplicate ourselves so that everyone gets one of us in their Happy Meal. But hurry, prepare to transfer. <laughs> McDonald released eight toys in all, with only two of them being carried over from the previous line. With all these toys to collect, it was next to damn near impossible to figure out which figure was waiting for you inside your Happy Meal. I wonder what I got. <gasps> what fries! Mom, I got the fries! Oh, hello. <laughs> yes, the outcome of what you found was about as random as the game show Press Your Luck. Come on, big bucks, no whammy, stop! What? Hand it over, sucker! All right, all right. <laughs> God, I love this show. During the first week of this Changeables toy offer, you could get yourself a RoboCakes or Galacta Burger. Week two offered Fry Force and Crypto Cup. Week three brought us Macromac and Turbo Cone. And week four brought us Frybot and C2, which I assume stands for Cheeseburger to the Second Power. Together, this massive set of seven Changeable. Seven? Where the hell did the other one go? Give me that! Stupid gummies. Together, this massive set of eight changeables was a force to be reckoned with. You could destroy cities, have epic scale battles with friends, eat them within a ah. single bite. Uh, just scratch that one. Yes, the changeables were a hit. So much so that McDonald's revisited the concept in 1991. But instead of food turning into robots, this set turned into. Yes, yes? Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs? Dinosaurs aren't cool! I'd rather play with Rainbow Bright Dolls! These dino changing things just didn't have the same appeal as the robots. And this in turn caused the entire concept to explode in a fiery pit of hellish agony that tortured souls for a millennia to come! How about some Hawaiian Punch? Alright guys, so, how do I rate these? 
Now when the Changeables first came out, I was actually a little late to the party and got some of the later releases. And I loved playing with these things as a kid. All my friends collected them and they had other ones that I didn't have. And a little later in life, I ended up meeting another friend who actually lived in St. Louis at the time when the original six came out. And he showed me things like the Egg McMuffin and the Chicken McNuggets. And it just blew my mind because I only knew of the eight that they released in my area. But these things bring back a lot of great memories and yeah, I'm gonna just, just gonna have to give this one a big nostalgic overload. All right guys, and until next time. Well, I think it's time for us to return home. Agreed. No, you don't, you're mine. <laughs> Where the hell am I? I was gonna <laughs> ask you the same thing. <laughs> hey, what's what? this? <laughs> I rate, 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 rate the 80s the only one. Today we're checking out those little baseball cards that when you collected every single one of them told an interesting story. And those were Comic Ball. In 1988, Upper Deck was the newest baseball card company to come along and compete against the likes of Topps and Dunruss. In an attempt to think outside the box, they decided to merge two unlikely licenses together, Looney Tunes and Baseball. Upper Deck also enlisted former cartoonist Chuck Jones to do all the artwork. And Looney Tunes Comic Ball was born. When these cards were placed together, a comic book type story was created that continued from card to card for almost 600 panels. Why, they're great! Why, you show stealing piece of crap! Of course, the odd thing about these cards was that the stories were printed on both the front and the back. And the only proper way to even read this story was by putting them in a baseball card binder page. And if you only had eight of the nine cards collected, that empty card slot would torture you till you went mad! Hulk <laughs> smash! The various stories in Comic Ball featured all the Looney Tune greats. Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Wile E. Coyote, Charlie Dog... Charlie Dog?! What the hell did Charlie Dog ever do to get not only featured in a Comic Ball story, but to also get featured in the longest story found in the entire set? This story lasts from the beginning all the way up to card 99. That's one fifth of a series! Boy, that's almost criminal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Boy, you show steel piece of crap! Of course, some of my favorite stories here include Acme Battle, Hold the Mustard, and Mighty Angelo. As classic as these cards were, there was also some odd things you could find in this series. In the story Hopalong Casualty, they wasted eight cards on just one throw alone. Uh, and some of these cards look like they were numbered out of order. Despite these drawbacks, reading a complete story was still a great feeling of accomplishment. And if you also managed to find all nine randomly packaged foil cards, you were super awesome. I did it! I'm awesome! Yeah! Of course, that was before Upper Deck decided to release a box set, making everyone who bought one just as awesome too. What? Hey, I got the full set! I got the full set too! Yeah, me three! <laughs> oh, this sucks. One year later, fans of Comic Ball were treated with another series from Upper Deck called Comic Ball 2, and this set actually merged the cartoon world with the real world. Just imagine that outcome. Yep. What's up, Gak? Bugs Bunny? You expecting maybe another bunny? Still going. Nothing outlasts Energizer. The Comic Ball Series 2 ended up fixing a lot of problems people had with the first set. First off was the number of cards to collect, which were scaled back by 100 cards. And gone was the printing of the stories on the back of the card, which was now reserved for nine puzzle card pieces, which you had to put together. I think this is trying to tell me something. This time, baseball stars Nolan Ryan and Reggie Jackson were added to the storylines to hopefully give this series more appeal to kids. <gasps> Nolan Ryan? Who's that? And sadly, Chuck Jones didn't return to do the artwork for this second set. And stay out, you bum! 
Even though this series had an artistic makeover, overall, they just didn't hit that sweet spot. And they ended up becoming just a little bit lackluster. Lackluster? Oh my god, is there a doctor in the house? Uh, I'm a doctor. Uh, yeah. In fact, the only stories that really stood out in my mind was the Wile E. Coyote Roadrunner debacle, the burger fight, and the Field of Dreams homage called Patch of Greens. But despite those setbacks, Upper Deck trudged on and released Comic Ball 3 shortly thereafter. And this set would feature new baseball stars like Jim Abbott, Ken Griffey Sr., Ken Griffey Jr., Ken Griffey Sophomore, Ken Griffey Freshman, and Ken Griffey and the Tonight Show Band. This installment didn't make any improvements over the second set, but at least this time around, Chuck Jones was brought back to create the seventh inning stretch series of cards featuring the Looney Tunes characters merged with baseball stars. Thanks for the extra sketches, buddy! Now get out and stay out! As for the stories here, there's really nothing too memorable. Just a Yosemite Sam and Bugs Bunny bleacher seat fight, a running gag of sports teams' names, and a handful of other silly stories that all blur together. Before the comic ball series officially ended, Upper Deck squeezed in one more set that took Looney Tunes to the NFL. Yep, baseball was out and football was in. Of course, the stories here weren't too memorable, so I'll just forgo the lengthy explanations. Of course, before driving that last nail into the coffin, Upper Deck actually released one last Looney Tunes card set called Adventures in Toon World that placed basketball star Michael Jordan center stage for more madcap adventures. And of course, all this laid the groundwork for the movie Space Jam, which coincidentally merged Looney Tunes with the real world, featured sports celebrities, and another sporting event for the Looney Tunes to compete in. At least this time, a silly baseball card border wouldn't be around the screen. Oh, this thing is awesome. Hey, how much will you give me for this? Well, let's see. Oh my god, I've never seen such a thing before. I, oh, oh, wait a minute. There's a crease in this thing that you can only see with a microscope. I'll give you $2 for it. <sighs> Your damn card dealers are all alike. Eh, it's a living. All right, guys, so how do I rate these? For me, the original comic ball series holds a special place in my heart. But man, what a nightmare it was to collect the entire story, especially when I only needed like 20 cards left. It was pointless for me to go out and just buy new packs because the whole thing would be full of duplicates that I didn't need. Like I said, the original set is very nostalgic to me. The other sets, not so much, but uh, as a whole, I have to give this thing a nostalgic mediocre. Well, and until next time, what the hell? Oh, sorry, man. Lionel Richie? The one and only. Well, if you can't beat them, join them. Today we're going to check out a little known movie produced by Disney starring Michael Jackson called Captain EO. Captain EO was a 17 minute movie produced in the 1980s that was only shown in two theaters in the entire world. Those were located at Disneyland and Disney World. The movie featured pop sensation Michael Jackson since the movie was filmed at the height of his career. With that kind of talent, you can see that Disney spared no expense with this movie. They also brought aboard George Lucas, who was fresh off his Return of the Jedi movie, as well as director Francis Ford Coppola from Godfather fame. Captain EO was a multi-million dollar project that was filmed in a Disney studio. For Disney to spend $30 million on a movie that wasn't getting a normal theatrical release was considered crazy. Captain EO would have elaborate sets and would use state-of-the-art technology like animatronics, puppets, special effects, and even claymation. This movie contained all the elements that would cause kids to beg their parents to take them to a Disney park to go and see. I myself visited Disney World in the 1980s and experienced this movie firsthand. And what I saw blew me away. This movie was presented in 4D. 
which means it's in 3D, the theater moves in sync with the explosions, and even water sprays on the audience during select scenes in the movie. Ah! I hope that's water. The story revolved around Captain EO and his ragtag team of companions who were all just drifting through space. Captain EO, of course, was played by the popular Michael Jackson, and his teammates were composed of robots Major Domo, Minor Domo, Fuzzball, and Hooter, who looks like he defected from Jabba's Max Rebo Band. There is also a two-headed alien, who I'm pretty sure is somehow related to the two-headed monster on Sesame Street. As their spaceship flies through space, a battle ensues. And of course, this is where George Lucas comes into play, as the next sequence of events appears to be totally Lucas-inspired. Lasers, explosions, and of course, an iconic trench for the spaceship to fly through before crashing onto the planet's surface. Use the force, Theo. After crash landing, the team is conflicted with two options. Should they stick around and fix the spaceship, or venture outside and get caught by the natives? When faced with these kind of conclusions, I think the outcome is obvious. Yep, get caught by the natives. The team is attacked by an enemy that looks pretty similar to the Borg from Star Trek. In fact, it looks even more than similar, since they have electronic body parts, move like Borg, and there's also a queen bad guy. Wait a minute, this is starting to look mighty suspicious, Paramount Studios. What do you have to say for yourselves? No comment. They even got popular actress Angelica Houston to play the Borg Queen, who still looks creepy without even wearing any makeup. In a last chance effort, Captain EO decides the only way to defeat these enemies is through music. Let me see, let's get it! And his entire crew then turns into instruments. You know, if I didn't find this so damn cool as a kid, I'd probably say some smart-ass comment right about now. As the instruments are put into place, Hooter's piano becomes just as deadly as the piano from the Goonies movie. Now Michael Jackson has the uncanny power to defeat enemies with his musical ray hands. Yeah, take that, you evil scum. Yeah, come on, Michael. Turn them all into the chorus line from the Cats musical. In order to finally take on the Queen, Captain EO then zaps her with his light rays, causing her to suffer from an orgasm of light that turns her into a princess. Huh, it's amazing what pent-up sexual frustrations can do to a woman. At the end of the movie, the day is saved, and it's all thanks to Captain EO and his friends. Alright guys, so how do I rate this? Now, I absolutely loved this movie when I was younger, and it was because it had all those elements like I pointed out. Special effects, and puppets, and animatronics, and all those kind of things. And just to go there and actually see this movie in person was incredible. Now, they ended up taking this movie out of the theaters in the 1990s, and it wasn't until after Michael Jackson's death that they actually put it back in for a few more years. And it just so happens that I revisited Disney World, and I was ecstatic to see it again. So yeah, I have to say that this movie for me, definite nostalgic overload. All right, I hope you enjoyed that trip down memory lane. I'm out of here. Um, the theater's now closed, sir. I'm stuck in the chair. All right, 80s fans, today we're looking at a product that had a very long lifespan, but really exploded in the 1980s, and that is Bazooka Joe. Bazooka Joe is the small bite-sized gum that comes wrapped with a comic strip. This small candy has been around for almost 80 years, but it was first only called Bazooka Bubblegum. The comic strips found inside at first would often vary in titles like Henry, Cracks and Jacks, and Doc Sorbones. Doc, you gotta help me. It hurts when I go like this. My diagnosis is don't do that. Oh. In the 1950s, Tops decided to rebrand their bubble gum with an official mascot by using the name of the company's president's son, merging it with the candy title, and adding an eye patch for pizzazz. Bazooka Joe was born. Oh, me too. In a little rascals-like fashion, a gang of others were also created that Joe could pal around with. Girlfriend Janet, brother Pesty, Walkie Talkie, Hungry Herman, and even his best friend Mort. Mort? 
Gosh, he reminds me of somebody. Well, hi ho there, neighbor. Oh, hey, Wilkins. Artist Wesley Morse ended up creating around 25 comics a year. These strips were composed of multiple panels of dialogue leading up to a cheesy gag at the end. Hey, Mort, where'd you get that black eye? You see that door over there? Yes. Well, I sure didn't. <laughs> the strip also offered other bonuses like fortunes. And by the 1970s, these fortunes began getting a little bit ridiculous. All right, men, time to suit up. You there, time to grab your best bombs. Artist Wesley Morse worked on the comic for almost a full decade up until his death in 1963. Over that time, he managed to knock out a few hundred strips that the company would slowly roll out and reused for many years that followed. This successful run even landed them a spot in a Viewmaster reel. Whoa, this 3D effect is so real! Don't fall off that tightrope, Joe! Oh no, he fell! Ah! By the time the 1980s rolled around, I myself had first stumbled onto the cool candy, which was right before Topps decided to give the comic its first real facelift. Bazooka Joe was drawn to be older, and he was given a whole new cast of characters to hang out with, like a new girlfriend, the girlfriend's friend, the greaser, the sister, and Mort, but gone was his trademark turtleneck. And they kept numbering them so you could trade them with your friends. Whoa, number 7720? I don't have this one! The 1980s also brought out the best of the brand. Tops brought out new candy products like the Bazooka Joe bubble gum balls, activity pads, maxi pads, and three brand new flavors. There was grape, cherry, and a green apple. The company also added in some nifty Bazooka Joe branded prizes that you could send away for with money and proof of purchases. These included pins, dolls, and even pillows. Damn it, bedtime bear, get off my pillow! As cool as the 1980s were for Bazooka Joe, eventually the 1990s came in with a revamp that would bring untold horrors to the strip. A host of brand new characters were brought in to show just how scary the 1990s really were. Funky hairdos, crazy shades, and DJ Jazzy Jeff? My God help us all. The next few decades would bring in a few more revamps that would keep removing the series further from its roots. But recently, in a surprising move, Topps decided to release a brand new box set of bubblegum that features the original cast of characters once again. My god, it's magnificent. Well, kinda. The inside packaging is not really what I expected. What the hell's this? Where's my comic? Alright, well that was lame. Well, at least the box is cool. All right, guys, so how do I rate these? I used to love going to the candy store and picking these things up for about three cents back in the day. And when they came out with the three all new flavors, everybody I knew just went nuts for them. Now, I personally hated what they did with Bazooka Joe in the 1990s because I thought it was a nostalgic misstep. But as for the rest of the series, of course, I'm gonna have to give this my nostalgic overload stamp of approval. All right, guys, well, thanks for watching. I'm gonna grab my keys and get out of here. Well, not again. Ah! Playing these video games all morning sure works up an appetite. Time to make myself some breakfast. All right, Ninja Turtle cereal. Aw, oh, man, I've been out of this since 1991. Face it, breakfast is ruined. Nintendo cereal system? Breakfast is saved! Now being a 1980s kid that grew up with the NES, when this cereal box was released in cereal shelves everywhere, it was kind of like a siren like call that called you to it. I ate it, all my friends ate it, and heck, I didn't know one kid that didn't eat this stuff. It was just a recipe for win. Nintendo Cereal is perhaps one of the coolest boxes ever to grace breakfast for gamers in the 1980s. I mean, heck, the box alone is iconic and nostalgic for everyone that remembers it. But the fun thing about the 1980s was that this was a decade that companies ushered in a plethora of cereals based on all the brands we loved. Smurfs, Batman, Ghostbusters, Cabbage Patch Dolls. Okay, even I have my limits, but nothing could be more deadly than Urkelos. Wait a minute, Urkelos? You mean the Did I Do That Kid? 
Oh, for crying out loud. I don't even remember this cereal. Ugh. Let's just move on before this turns into an irate Family Matters rant. Nintendo had really hit a stride with kids by 1989, with games like Super Mario Bros. and Legend of Zelda both becoming household staples. That spring, a Nintendo cereal was finally released, which brought this video game epicness to a whole new level. But not just Nintendo cereal, but the Nintendo cereal system, which was kind of an odd name since it doesn't play video games. Now, fun fact about this cereal is that it's made by a company named Ralston, which also coincidentally made the Ninja Turtles cereal that I reviewed a couple years ago. Unfortunately, one factoid I seemed to overlook as a kid was that the cereal was that this company was owned by the Peoria Dog Chow Company. Well, despite that funny tidbit, I can't tell you how iconic of a box this is because this thing just oozes nostalgia. On this side, we have Super Mario Brothers over here, which is called the Action Series. And on the other side, well, we have Legend of Zelda, which is called the Adventure Series, because, well, that's what both their games embody. Now, the cool thing about this cereal was that it has two flaps on the top, one over here and one over here, one for each separate cereal, because inside, we have two different cereals to choose from. On the left side of this box, which was all things Super Mario Brothers, well, everything was coming up fruity with these really cool fruity flavors. On the right side of this box, well, everything was coming up berry with Legend of Zelda and their berry-like flavors. Now, I'm pretty sure that this is the first time that they combined two different cereals in one box, and I think this was to drive home the Nintendo cereal system, because in the same way that the Nintendo gives you a variety of games to choose from, well, this time they're gonna give you a variety of cereals to choose from. So this cool Nintendo cereal was released in April of 1989, and you can head to your nearest grocer and pick one up for the suggested retail of $2.50. Now back in the day, these gimmicky cereals right here always cost just a little bit more of the other cereals like corn pops, corn flakes, or whatever corn poop was out back then. But I gotta show you this hilarious article back from 1989 that I know you guys will enjoy. Because during this whole article, this lady ends up flipping out over the price of cereal being around $3 a box. I reached for a box of cereal and froze in shock before I took it off the shelf. I certainly couldn't afford to buy any with the price of a $3 a box. Good heavens! And the most ironic part about this is that if you go into eBay right now and you want to buy one of these, an empty box, an empty box, mind you, will cost you $300 to purchase. $300! That is a hell of a markup. And these things weren't rare to find either. You could find these at every single grocery store. So I just can't believe that they're $300 to buy now. And I can't tell you how many I bought of these and just threw the box away. Boy, was I stupid. But all right, fine. If $3 is gonna blow your budget, lady, here, go get yourself some Lucky Beans. They're three for a dollar. But I gotta tell you, any kid that grew up in the 1980s knows how iconic of a breakfast this was because you could pretty much pick your own adventure and have your own cereal at your disposal. So let's open up the uh, Mario cereal here and dig in. Now this fruity flavored Mario cereal was pretty darn epic as it had three distinct colors, orange, yellow, and green. And what's even cooler is that each cereal had their own cereal shapes that came straight from the video game. We had Goombas, Turtles, Mushrooms, and King Koopa himself, Bowser. And if you found yourself not wanting fruity cereal, well, you could always choose the other side, Legend of Zelda, which gave you a berry flavor. And this cereal was just as cool as it gave you different colors, in purple, red, and yellow colors, with shapes coming right out of the Legend of Zelda video game, like Link himself, shields, hearts, keys, and boomerangs. And of course, the only downside is that half the baggie fits in a bowl. I guess this does get expensive. And once this Nintendo cereal system was released to the masses, well, it didn't take long for the cereal to become a hit and knock their competitors off their pedestal. Oh, get out of here, Urkel! And by 1990, this cereal had become one of the hottest cereals in the cereal aisle, alongside Batman and Ninja Turtle cereal. Huh, way to go. And I'm sure that most of this cereal's popularity probably came from that catchy Nintendo cereal commercial that aired on TV about every five seconds with that damn jingle of Nintendo. Nintendo. It's for breakfast now. Nintendo. It's the cereal. Wow. Nintendo. Super Mario Jump. Nintendo. In a fruit flavor. 
Man, talk about an anthem of a generation. You just say those three words in that cadence to anyone growing up in the 1980s, and they'll know exactly what you're talking about. And man, talk about a crazy commercial too. Three kids bobbing around the screen with TVs on their head? I'm not sure what acid trip the marketing guy was on when he made this commercial, but hell, it must have worked on me because I remember eating this cereal like it was going out of style back then. Yang Tang Do. Oh my god. Now another cool thing about this cereal is that the three years that it was around, well it didn't just keep the same images on the box, because they ended up changing the box art eight different times over its life cycle. Now the cool thing about this cereal is that it was released back when they were still putting prizes in the box. And one of the first items they offered were things like iron-on transfers, one of Mario, one of Zelda, and well these things really sucked because most of the time you had to sit there and burn a hole into your shirt before it actually fused into the fabric. Ah! Other prizes included things like Mario rulers, which now sells for $50 on eBay, and limited edition holographic shirts, which lists for a thousand bucks. Or what about those little mini pinball games, which if you look those up on eBay, $2,500? Oh man, I had one of those too. Ah! And they also had these lenticular cards with Mario, with tips and tricks from the video game printed on the back. Okay, to become small, fiery Mario? I never heard of this trick. Now let's try it. So let's see, I have to become Big Mario in the castle, hit Bowser on his head and the axe at the same time when you defeat him. Then on the next level, get the mushroom. Uh, hold on, it makes you shrink down. Then get the fire flower. What the hell? You can actually become Small Fire Mario? I was played this game like 500,000 hours. How come I didn't know about this? Oh, get out of here. And according to this article here, I guess some later boxes from 1991 contain phone numbers that you could call to get tips and tricks about your favorite Nintendo games. Then he goes on to say that he wishes there was a phone number he can call to help him with his golf score. But check out this interesting anecdote. On the way out of the grocery store, I noticed a kid suffering through the final moments of a video game in the lobby. He kicked and cussed out the machine as the game over flashed across the screen. Huh, I realized this guy was watching me in action back then. Now even though these pack-in items were pretty cool, well nothing could beat those memorable cards that were printed on the back of the box, which he had to cut out and collect. And there are 12 in all, which featured all your favorite video game characters. Oh man, does this take me back. I remember having to buy every single box and cutting these stupid things out just so I could have them all. Get all three boxes and you yourself could have yourself a full set of 12. Then you can flip them all over and have a picking war with your friends. All right, Ronnie, let's do this. Oh, oh, this is gonna be fantastic. I can't wait to see who I pick. All right, let's see who I can get. And I get the card of, ooh, it's Link. Oh, I just love this card. Okay, my turn to pick one, and... Oh man! Not for crying out loud, this is the lamest card in the bunch! Alright, let's pick another card here! And this time we get... Oh, it's Princess Peach! Uh, let's try this again. Old woman! Of all the cool characters in the game, they made the old woman? Oh, come on! Ah! Now, since Nintendo had their own cereal, it only made sense to push all their other products all over these boxes. Like on the back of this box, well, we can save $6 on your Nintendo Power subscription. And on other boxes, well, they pushed power pads, power gloves, Game & Watches, and also this Nintendo Power 3-Minute Cassette Tape, which contained all kinds of tips and tricks for your favorite NES video games. A 3-Minute Audio Cassette Tape? I wonder what that sounds like. Well, let's find out. Hi, Power Players. Listen up, and we'll provide you with tips for some of your favorite NES game packs. Here we go. For Akari Warriors, right after... Akari Warriors? Oh, cool. Wait a minute, I don't have that. In Hudson's Adventure Island, find... Adventure Island! Wait a minute, I don't have that either. In Gradius. Gradius? What the hell's Gradius? Does it mean Gradius? Who the hell owns that? Up on the control pad, and then B-A, 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 
crying out loud. But I do wonder how much that cassette tape costs on eBay here. $4,000? Ugh. Now as cool as this cereal was, all good things must come to an end. And at the end of 1991, well, this cereal supported the last bowl. But even though this cereal's long gone from cereal shelves, its memory is far from forgotten. Especially those crazy commercials too. Nintendo. It's a video game cereal. Nintendo. Made in 1989. Nintendo. One side has Mario. Nintendo. The other side Zelda. Nintendo. I'll eat it then I'll beat it. Nintendo. What a flavorful crunch. Nintendo. It's a cereal wow. I'll open up the box and I'll find the prize. There's fruity and berry on either side. Just pour me a bowl before I go insane. Which one to open for a high score to gain? The cereal shapes are taken from video games. Contains those sprites from Mario and Zelda fame. Goombas, turtles, mushrooms, no shape is ever lame. Shields, keys, hearts, will we ever see this again? Open the box to get the goodies inside. Rollers and transfers and mini pinball games? There's even trading cards on the back of these boxes. Just be careful what you pick because there's no second chances. Ah, the old woman, no! Nintendo. It's a video game cereal. Nintendo. With an annoying commercial. Nintendo. Buy the cereal for me, Mom! Nintendo. If I don't get it, I'll die! Nintendo. What a flavorful crunch! Nintendo. All oh, breakfast is saved! Nintendo. Nintendo. It's a cereal yum! Alright guys, welcome to another episode of I Rate the 80s, and last time you might remember, I made a quick humorous joke involving the Urkelos cereal. Nothing could be more deadly than Urkelos. Wait a minute, Urkelos? You mean the Did I Do That Kid? Oh, for crying out loud, I don't even remember this cereal. Ugh. Let's just move on before this turns into an irate Family Matters rant. Now what's interesting is that some of you thought I was joking, but nope, this cereal is real and it actually exists. And it caused such a commotion in the comments that I thought, you know what, I'm gonna go ahead and buy myself a box and review it for today's episode. So all you goofballs out there that said in the comments, I wish you would do a Family Matters rant. Well, wish granted, sort of. Ah yes, Family Matters. Now this was a popular sitcom that aired in the 1990s as part of the TGIF sitcom block on ABC, and it was a comedy evening that gave us must-see hits like Full House, Perfect Strangers, Step by Step, Boy Meets World, Hang of Mr. Cooper, and they can't all be winners. But this evening was also home to a show called Family Matters, in which the breakout star of the show was a nerdy neighbor kid next door called Steve Urkel. Did I do that? 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 And this show became so big that somehow it ended up getting its own cereal in the cereal aisle? Now for a sitcom to get its own breakfast cereal, that's unheard of. I mean, even Seinfeld, which is probably the greatest sitcom of all time, they never got their own cereal. In fact, I could probably count on my hand the times that it's happened. But when it came to Family Matters and Urkel, well, he was big enough to get his own cereal about four years into the show's existence. For this not being a cartoon series, unreal. So in January of 1992, it was announced in newspapers that this cereal would be coming in April, and Urkelos would be made by the company called Ralston, which was well known for making these other popular cereals like Nintendo, Batman, and Ninja Turtles cereal, which were all iconic in the 1990s. And like I've also pointed out in the past, Ralston here was part of the Purina Dog Chow Company. But as long as it doesn't taste like dog food, that's well, good enough for me. So when Urkelos hit the cereal aisle in April of that year, many grocers ran specials where you could purchase two boxes for the price of one. As a special to all my fans out there, if you want to try this for your very own, here's a nice coupon for you that you can print and cut out and take to your nearest grocer. 
which I'm sure they'll all gladly accept today. I should probably point out that this was the second box they actually made during the cereal's lifespan, because the first cereal box looked like this. Pretty simple, with Urkel on the front. But since 1992 was an election year, well, looks like Ralston went all out, so you can vote for Urkel for president. So yeah, on the back, there is a contest where you can win a trip to Washington, D.C. So you can see the swearing in ceremony of Urkel himself for president. And it looks like there's three campaign buttons to collect inside. And a big old proof of purchase featuring Urkel himself, which I'm not sure what you'd need Urkel as proof of purchases for. Maybe if you turn in like 50 of them, you can get yourself an Urkel doll or something. And pour myself a bowl of this ancient cereal from the 1990s. We see red and yellow loops, which kind of resembles Fruit Loops. But all right, now that we've got the cereal out of the way, let's check out that prize. That's way down in the box. All right, an Urkel for President badge. All right, one down, two more to go. And hold on to your asses for this one, guys, because there was also an Urkel cereal commercial. Huh. So you'll be Urkelized with Urkelos. What the hell does that mean exactly? If I take one bite of the cereal, I'll actually become an Urkel? Who'd want that? Well, just for shits and churn stomach giggles, let's take a bite of this and see what will actually happen. Oh man, did I do that? Ah. Well, despite the cereal's campaign promise to turn everyone into Steve Urkel nerds, Urkelos only appeared in the cereal aisle throughout 1992, and by 1993, it had disappeared. Now you could probably argue all day if this cereal was a terrible gimmick or not, but this cereal was so random that it was even made fun of on an episode of The Simpsons. Urkelos, delicious, but forbidden. Huh, cool. Now Urkelos here might not be as iconic as these other cereals, but when it comes to the 1990s, I gotta say Urkelos is pretty nostalgic. Did I do that? Ugh. I Read the 80s is a show uh, that focuses on pop culture things from the 1980s. And I try to present these things in a way that includes both documentary and humor and try to meld those things to present a compelling episode. Now, the first incarnation of this show was actually called The Breakfast Ramp. And the first episode I did was uh, Lucky Charms, how the Lucky Charms aren't the same Lucky Charms that we grew up with. They changed out the shapes and all this other stuff. But the problem with the breakfast rant is I kind of pigeonholed myself into being able to only review uh, breakfast cereals. I wanted to expand that scope and just be able to review a whole multitude of things from the 1980s. What the? Snarf, snarf! Snarf, snarf! So I ended up reworking the idea and I ultimately came up with I Rate the 80s. And the name came from using the uh, double entendre uh, word that I use, I rate, in the I Rate Gamer show. In one sense, I'm I rate, but I'm also rating. And at first, I thought it would be kind of like the uh, I Love the 80s show that used to air on VH1. But this incarnation would have humor, it would have documentary, and showcase where these things came from and, and poking fun at a lot of things that happened in the same time frame. What the hell? Ah, oh, crap. The first three episodes that I did were kind of me feeling out what this show would be. The first episode, Yummy Mummy, I ended up picking Yummy Mummy for the first episode because it, it was around Halloween time and it was just one of those cereals that I was like, whatever happened to this cereal? You would see commercials for it all the time watching the Saturday morning cartoons and, you know, of course you see the other three cereals nowadays, but Yummy Mummy is the one missing from the lineup and hardly 
anyone remembers uh, that cereal. So I thought, what a perfect way to kind of uh, bring that back to the forefront and be like, hey, do you guys remember this stuff? I do too. Let's talk about it. The second episode came about when I went down the Kool-Aid aisle and they had 10 flavors. Uh, far cry from the former glory of what Kool-Aid used to be. And uh, I thought, okay, well, there's an episode. And the next episode was a no-brainer for me, Garbage Pail Kids. That was the one thing that uh, I used to love. And uh, yeah, it turned out to be a really good episode, I think. I had let a year pass before I did episode four. And I'm glad I did because I was able to get an HD camera and I was like, okay, a year has passed since I've done I Rate the 80s. Let me go back and revisit it and try to make it more fleshed out. And one of the things I wanted to do was rate the product that I was talking about at the end because after all, it is called I Rate the 80s. All right, guys, so how do I rate these? And also during this reformatting of the show, I would have myself interacting with some of the things I was reviewing, like the Micro Machines, Mad Balls, oh, He-Man. Hey, baby, come here often. Mm. And I just wanted to have a lot of sight gags from the 1980s uh, thrown in there as well. <laughs> Power! Now, a lot of these jokes require a lot of green screening and a lot of time editing and just putting them together. And a lot of work goes to putting these scenes in to make them look flawless. And, you know, sometimes you have to tape it over and over again just to get it right, uh, just to make the scene work. But when it comes together and you see it for the first time uh, without the green screen in the background and everything just clicks and timing is right, it's just a wonderful feeling uh, seeing that scene play out. Now, of course, you know, I didn't have a camera on me 24 seven back when I was growing up in the 80s. So I did the next best thing, dress up like a little kid and showcase myself in the 80s, reliving how I would react to some of these things that happened back then. And I love kind of putting on the uniform and being the younger Chris and kind of showing people how I would have reacted uh, back then. Welcome back, Cotter. What the hell is this shit? Ultimately, the topics that I pick for the uh, I Rate the 80 show is stuff that you know, is near and dear to my heart, the Bud Bowls. I always grew up uh, watching the Bud Bowl and when they started taking it away, uh, every year, I just kind of hoped that they would play another Bud Bowl. Color forms, you know, you really don't see these things anymore. Back when I was growing up, I think every household had at least one color form. Micro Machines, same thing. I grew up loving these things. And when they came out with that Travel City, uh, wow, I just, I had to have it. Mad Balls, another thing. Uh, you know, while researching it, I guess it was just, you know, the small fad that happened within the span of a couple months. But uh, while I was growing up, it resonated with me so much, I thought, okay, let's do an episode on it. When I picked Ninja Turtle cereal, uh, I was just kind of reminiscing about all the old breakfast cereals that I used to eat as a kid. And uh, I ended up looking on eBay for a box for the episode. And lo and behold, I found the one that was unopened. I don't know how common that is, but I just thought that was really cool finding an unopened box. The next episode I did was He-Man, and I don't think kids these days realize the impact that He-Man had. It was just a thing to collect back then with young boys. Ooh, fuzzy. The first season of I Rate the 80s did have its set of growing pains, but uh, by the end of season one, I think the show really came into its own and uh, I really found the flavor of what the show needed to be. Oh no, you don't. And I've just got so many more things that I want to get to for season two. But uh, for season one, I mean, we did some fantastic stuff, uh, went into some areas that were very, very obscure. And I remember with Family Guy, I remember when they were talking about it, they loved throwing those references in where only maybe you know, 
20% of the people would actually get the joke. And that's kind of what I'm gearing myself for. I mean, how many people would pick up on the Freakies from the Freaky Serial? Or the inclusion of the bad guy from the Pac-Man cartoon? Ah, so hard to find good help these days. You know, only so many people are going to pick up those jokes. But, you know, if you do, you're going to laugh that much harder because you're like, oh my god, I remember that. So that's kind of the audience that I'm gearing the, uh, the show for. I hate this game! You know, things I would just love to get to uh, for season two. Just look at the table at the beginning of the episode. Battle Beasts, McDonald's, Transformers, G.I. Joe. I would love to get to all these things. The only thing that really holds me back is price points. Uh, one of the things that I get the most requests for is doing one on Transformers. I would love to do Transformers, but the fact of the matter is, each Transformer costs 10 to $20. So for me to do an episode on Transformers is going to be very, very expensive. But uh, one day, one day you might see me get to the Transformers franchise. Silly Skeletor, he made it for kids. Hey, that's my line! Today on I Rate the 80s, we're looking at the toys that forever revolutionized the toy industry. And those just happen to be the elf of the thumb. I won't tell you how I ended up with this item, but let's just say a friend gave it to me. Whoops. I love you, Madball. Well, I personally love playing around with these little muscle men was that book. Yeah? What more could a muscle muscle jeez. Now, I personally loved these little muscle men as a kid, but I just wish we would have got that cartoon. <sighs> ah, well. I'll just give some. Fuck! Welcome back, 80s fans, to another edition of I Rate the 80s. And this time, we're checking out those little paths. Path uh, boy. Why are their bandanas red? What is the reason behind this? And why is this damn level. <laughs> why are all their bandanas red? What's the reason behind this? And why this is. <laughs> Why are their bandanas red? What is the reason behind this? Why is this water level so damn hard? <laughs> hey, it finally came in the mail! Hey. My Ninja Turtle cereal, all the way from, all the way from Afghanistan! <laughs> 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 what the heck was I thinking? Oh boy. Okay, wow, okay. Hey, the cereal back? Yeah. I think it left. Yeah. Alright, see you. Ah, it's hot down Alright, hey, see you later, man. Hey, alright. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> to find good help these days. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it, Mesmeron. Oh, oh, what's this supposed to mean? 